Teaching, Reason, and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And welcome back to the show, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Tuesday. I hope everybody had a great Memorial Day. We are talking about Saint Isaac of Nineveh, or the Syrian, uh, his piety, his uh, life and history, and his theology. Joined by returning guest, Doctor Sebastian Brock, an expert in the Syriac tradition. Doctor Brock, it's an honor to have you back on the show. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good to be with you. Great. And and there are some people who are new to the channel. So could you briefly just tell us about yourself and some of the work that you do? Well, I'm a retired uh, reader in Syriac studies. Reader is a special Oxford title. Uh, and I've uh, all my life I've been interested in Syriac, at least since my, <clears throat> uh, all my university life, perhaps I should say. And uh, I work mainly on editing and translating Syriac texts now in my retirement. And I've had uh, a very blessed life in that I discovered all sorts of fascinating texts and I've tried to bring them to light. So uh, that's about it. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about St. Isaac the Syrian. Could you maybe start us out with just him as a figure historically? Yes, perhaps a bit of background. Uh, Isaac the Syrian doesn't mean that he came from what we think of as Syria today. Mm -hmm. uh, it means the Syriac. And Syriac is a Semitic language. It's a branch of Aramaic. Aramaic was spoken by our Lord in Palestine in the first century. And people who pray in the Syriac churches, the Lord's Prayer today in Syriac, that would have been comprehensible to a first century AD Jew, more or less. They would have certainly gained the uh, basic idea. Mm -hmm. Now, one's apt to think of Christian tradition as having just a Latin West and a Greek East, but mm -hmm. I've always tried to emphasize that there's a third element, the a Syriac Orient, and that's the not only the Syriac churches, but the other indigenous churches of the Middle East, because Christianity spread west into Greek and Latin, but it also spread east in Syriac, and it's uh, through the Syriac channels that Arabic Christianity uh, uh, <clears throat> came into being, and then Ethiopic, and further east too. Uh, the Syriac tradition is quite remarkable for many different things, one of which is the practice of conducting theology through poetry. And the real master of this is St. Ephraim the Syrian, whom Pope Benedict XV proclaimed a doctor of the Universal Church uh, 102 years ago this year, and rightly so because St. Ephraim had a remarkable vision of the relationship between humanity, or the material world, and the spiritual world. And it's a vision which I find very exciting and also uh, very penetrating and uh, seemed to me important for uh, the present understanding of the ecological crisis and so on. So he lived in the 4th century, but Isaac belongs to the 7th century, and Isaac comes after the great division in Eastern Christianity. Uh, the Council of Chalcedon produced not the end of doctrinal development, but it produced schism. And a large part of the East, or two large parts of the East, broke away from what one thinks of as the mainstream church. In fact, there are two uh, churches which emerged after the Council of Chalcedon in 451, the Syrian Orthodox and the Church of the East, today called the Assyrian Church of the East. Mm -hmm. And th they were basically a Syrian Orthodox Church in um, Eastern Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, and the Assyrian Church of the East further east in what we think of as Iraq, Iran. Mm -hmm. 
now Isaac belongs to the Church of the East and in the seventh century he uh, came from a rather surprising background. He came from the region of Qatar. We don't think of Qatar today as having anything to do with Christianity. Mm. But uh, in the seventh century, it was the home of a number of intellectuals of the Church of the East. And we know the writings of quite a number of these, but the best known is Isaac of Nineveh. Well, where does the Nineveh come from? That is because around about 670, the patriarch of the Church of these went to the Qatar region and brought Isaac back to Iraq and consecrated him bishop of Nineveh, which is more or less modern Mosul. Uh, Isaac wasn't fitted out, actually, as a bishop and after a few months he resigned. Uh, the few biographical details that we have about his life simply say that it was for reasons that God alone knows. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's fully to speculate. Um, Isaac retired to what one calls the desert, but in fact the mountainous region of western Iran, and he was associated with the monastery of Rabban Shabur, which produced a number of very famous monks. And he lived as a solitary, which uh, in uh, the Syriac monastic tradition meant that uh, you lived as a hermit in a cell somewhere not far from a monastery to which you were attached. You went into the monastery, for the Sunday liturgy and the vigil on Saturday night, and then you were provided by the economists of the monastery with food for the next week, and you go back to your cell. Mm. You probably have a disciple, and it's uh, probably through a disciple that we have Isaac's writing, since we are told in one of the biographical sources that he went blind at the end mm. of his life. And indeed, quite a number of his writings do rather sound if they're taken down from uh, his his dictation, as it were. That means they're quite hard to uh, translate because the syntax becomes quite complicated. So mm -hmm. it's wander on for pages. <clears throat> well, St. Isaac uh, <clears throat> is not a unique phenomenon, phenomenon in the Eastern Church. Uh, but he was a product of a revival of monasticism that took place in the 6th century. Uh, and the 7th and 8th centuries produced a whole lot of very famous, or at least famous in the Church of the East, of monastic authors whose writings come down to us today. But Isaac uh, had the good fortune um, to have part of his works translated into Greek round about 800 at the monastery of Marsaba near Jerusalem. In, <clears throat> and it was through this Greek translation that he reached the Western, the European world, uh, translated into Latin and the Middle Ages and into Slavonic. And he's always been a very important monastic writer in especially the Greek and Russian Orthodox tradition. So um, that is where, until at least uh, fairly recently, he has been most, favor most famous and most appreciated. But um, in 1983, I had the good fortune to discover in one of the Oxford libraries uh, a manuscript with the second part, so a whole lot of new discourses by Isaac, and these are now available, have been published. And then shortly after that, uh, an Italian colleague, um, Sabino Chiala, discovered a third collection, mm -hmm. and that too has now been published. So we now have many more writings uh, than we had, well, just uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. And these have rapidly been translated into many different languages. 
and um, so Isaac is has become quite famous mm. uh, as a result of these new texts. I'm curious, when you discovered these new texts, how do you authenticate that it actually is his work and not maybe the work of somebody else? Well, that's always <laughs> very difficult. Um, the, the best guide, I think, is the similarity of thought and language with uh, works that uh, basically the first part, the, mm -hmm. the works that are already known. And uh, that applies certainly to the second part mm -hmm. and uh, pretty certainly to the third part. There are one or two exceptions. There are one or two discourses. In the third part, there's a, a discourse in verse, which almost certainly isn't a, a, by Isaac. It's actually attributed in some manuscripts to uh, Ephraim, but it's not by Ephraim mm -hmm. either, certainly. Uh, but, it, it's partly on the content, the style, also the what the manuscripts tell you. Uh, there's all, all the manuscripts that we have for Isaac, for both parts, uh, they say they do attribute it to Isaac the Syrian. And um, that it's quite mm -hmm. strong evidence. Yeah. So why do you think he's so popular um, these days? Do you think it's because of his sanctity, because of his theological insight, or, or both? I think it's because he's a rare writer who has the ability of speaking over the centuries to modern audience or modern readership. And I think in my own uh, sort of experience, reading people like Maximus Confessor, they're wonderful, but you have to know someone, something about the background and they're written within, I suppose it's the Greek rhetorical tradition, mm -hmm. which isn't all that sympathetic to with um, among modern readership, I to say, whereas, Syriac doesn't have this sort of rhetorical background. So that may be one um, aspect. Uh, I might read you a lovely pa passage sure. by a monk on Mount Athos, who's a great mm -hmm. connoisseur of Isaac. And he tells of a novice monk on Mount Athos who is given a volume of St. Isaac's writings. Mm -hmm. And it expresses very well how Isaac seems to speak to a modern audience, or at least to this, this man, but to many others as well, in my experience. And this young monk says, novice, <clears throat> says, I am reading St. Isaac the Syrian. I find something true, heroic, spiritual in him something which transcends space and time. I feel that here, for the first time, is a voice which resonates in the deepest parts of my being, hitherto closed and unknown to me. Although he is so far removed from me in space and time, he has come right into the house of my soul. In a moment of quiet, he has spoken to me, sat down beside me, Although I have read so many other things, although I have met so many other people, and though today there are other things living around me, others living around me, no one else has been so discerning. To no one else have I opened the door of my soul in this way. Hmm. Or to put it better, no one else has shown me in such a brotherly, friendly way that within myself, within human nature, there is a door a door which opens onto a space which is open, unlimited. And no one else has told me this unexpected and ineffable truth that the whole of this inner world belongs to a human person. Hmm. So that, wow. I think, will speak for many people who have read St. Isaac. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I have definitely enjoyed reading him. Um,
have one of those thick volumes with his collected works and sometimes yeah. i'll read just some of his homilies and they're they're very well done very insightful also very convicting <laughs> oh yeah 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 right <laughs> but in a gentle way you know not yeah. a, not in a con you know yeah. condemning way but <laughs> yeah so let's maybe talk about his um theological perspectives what what are some key insights that he provides uh to us theologically that we we should be aware of when speaking about him i think the two great themes in isaac are humility and love mm. um, humility is um Isaac speaks of the divine word, uh, God the word, putting on humility, clothing himself in humility. And so the response to that divine descent into human uh, existence uh, is a response that requires humility. And uh, again and again, he stresses this. This is the, the only way that one should approach God. And then love uh, is very strong on the overwhelming nature of God's love. I and mean, it's quite beyond human comprehension. And then that love requires, uh, as it were, reflecting. And that the whole purpose of salvation history is to uh, bring attention to humanity of the existence of this love and for humanity to reflect that insofar as it's possible in some dim way. Hmm. You know, I'm I'm curious, what was his perspective about the Council of Chalcedon? Did, did he comment on it explicitly? No, no. <clears throat> uh, in fact, there's very little discussion of the Council. One thing that's very important to remember, actually, uh, is that the Council of Chalcedon and all the other councils took place within the Roman Empire, or the later Byzantine Empire. Isaac was living under Arab rule, uh, but even before that, uh, he was living in the area long way uh, outside the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So the councils uh, refer only to the church within the Roman Empire. They had imperial officials at them and they were usually convened by the emperor. So the Council of Chalcedon had nothing to do with the Church of the East. So the few writers that do comment on, on it say but it had some merits. Uh, it's a diophysite Christology. That's fine for them, for the Church of the East. But it made errors in other matters. Mm. And uh, so they take a sort of mixed view of it. It's neither really bad. Uh, for the Syrian Orthodox, it is really bad. But uh, for the Church of the East, it's, uh, it has some merits. I'm curious what, what they would have thought were some uh, problematic aspects. You said that they thought that there were some other issues. What, what exactly were they? I'm just curious. Well, I suppose primarily is the, um, <clears throat> the implied condemnation of a number of their writers. Uh, Theod Theodore of Mopsuestia, who mm. was their main guru, uh, he's called the exegete par excellence, mm -hmm. had fallen out of favor in the mainstream Greek church in the 430s after his death in 428. And by the time of the Council of Chalcedon, he was definitely a persona non grata to uh, most people. And so it's that attitude, and Theodore was uh, explicitly condemned at the Fifth uh, Council of Constantinople in the middle of 553. Uh, so that, that was a grievance. And uh, Nestorius um, was also, uh, of course, condemned at Chalcedon. Uh, Nestorius was actually very little known to people in the Church of the East. Uh, his uh, um, one work, which eventually became known, was only translated uh, in the 6th century. It's the Book of Heraclides, mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, which is mostly by Nestorius himself, and it was written at the end of his life, and it's, it's uh, sort of a rather aggrieved um, defense of his position. Mm -hmm. Nestorius basically a name for the Church of the East. He was someone who, along with Theodore, was as it were, uh, persecuted by the Chalcedonian tradition. And so uh, he's, uh, he's a victim of the, um, as it were, persecution of, of the diophysite position of mm. the two nature uh, theology, Christology of the Church of the East. And uh, so that's why they have an anaphora which is under Nestorius's name. They also have one under, under the name of Theodore. Uh, but Nestorius, as a, a theologian, is not actually well known, and nor is he of particular importance. Theodore is a great figure for them. Who are some of the people that Isaac the Syrian was influenced by? Who are some important figures? Yeah. Well, there are several figures who he clearly admired very much. And the one who he calls his uh, real um, master in, uh, in spiritual knowledge is Evagrius of Pontus. Mm. Now, Evagrius was another person who came under uh, suspicion in the Greek tradition, or even though he was extremely influential. Uh, Evagrius was eventually uh, condemned, and uh, so his writings only survive in uh, large quantities in Syriac and in Armenian, as luckily they were translated before uh, Evagrius was condemned in the Greek tradition. But there is a certain amount of Evagrius in Greek, but under other people's names usually. If you like the text, but you don't like the author, you change the name. And so when Isaac's writings got into Greek in the uh, early ninth century, the names of people like Theodore, Theodore does get mentioned. Uh, Nestorius never gets mentioned. Theodore gets mentioned. So what happens is that he's replaced by someone respectable like Nilus or John Chrysostom. Uh, and Diodor too, his name is changed. But, uh, <clears throat> but what is remarkable in Isaac's case is that uh, in the Greek translation at Marsava Monastery, his title, Bishop of Nineveh, was retained. Uh, that's quite remarkable. Kind of gives them away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, one thing that I often hear about Isaac the Syrian, which I I have not been able to verify, but I've I've heard it quite often, is that he teaches a form of apocatastasis, uh, which, <clears throat> as I understand, is 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 effectively a form of universalism. Could could you maybe comment on that? Yes, the various forms that this takes, it's often connected, and especially in the Greek tradition, when it's linked with the name of Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, then it's tied up with speculation about uh, the beginning of time, beginning mm -hmm. of creation, and the creation of souls. Uh, Isaac is not interested in that, and he doesn't speculate on that. He is interested in the es in the eschatological uh, <clears throat> aspect of of this tradition, and. Uh, he approaches it in a very different way, I think, from the Greek tradition. Um, and he has an antecedent in Ephraim who has hints towards uh, the idea of universal salvation. But Isaac, um, in the already in the first part of his writings, the, the part that got into Greek, he has hints about his thoughts on this subject. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the second part, right at the end of the second part, that there are four or five chapters which deal with this. And uh, he's very hesitant. And he speaks of the difficult problem of Gehenna. Mm. 
and how should one understood this is does Gehenna last forever or is there something possibly beyond it mm -hmm. and he says that if you believe in a god of love the eternity of Gehenna would mean that human sin has overcome God's loving purpose for his creation mm. and so he speculates that <clears throat> there must be some hidden mystery which lies beyond as it were of course that one's living outside time uh, but, but from our historical perspective beyond Gehenna or hell so it's this aspect of divine love and this love is an even love for all uh, human all, all human beings whether good or bad and their badness if they are bad is a secondary element in uh, god's eternal purpose so uh, isaac is saying that God did not create the world in order to uh, punish uh, evil action by human beings, but uh, there is some other outcome which is consonant with his loving purpose. And uh, his understanding of Gehenna is... Uh, I mean, Gehenna is certainly not the place anyone wants to go. He says it's far worse than anything else you can actually imagine. But you are yourself the judge. Because, and, and here he's picking up, I think, on something that Ephraim says. Ephraim has a wonderful picture or portrayal of a judgment where he uh, uh, imagines that all one's words and all one's thoughts, as it were, uh, solidify themselves and emerge from you and accuse you. Hmm. So, all, and all your actions, of course, as well. So, you are the, your own judge. So, you suddenly have this revelation at judgment of hmm. all the sinfulness, of all the dreadful things you've done. And it's this is. Um, the pain that's uh, caused by this he says that the pain caused by the realization of the extent of god's love and how one is rejected or person is rejected is far greater than any physical pain so it's a psychological pain that um, is uh, involved wow um how has the Syriac tradition received his perspective here? Has it been favorable? Has it been concerning? Well, um, it was controversial. Mm. <laughs> it remains there. <laughs> it remains there. Um, it, uh, there were people uh, in, after Isaac's death who complained about it, and uh, along with another writer, John the Elder or John of Dalyatha, who held very similar ideas. And um, it's said that there were a number of patriarchs who disapproved of him, uh, but he was never formally condemned in the Syriac church. And um, the writings survived, they weren't suppressed. So um, I think the controversy died down. Yeah, okay. That, now, does he comment on Islam in any of his writings by any chance? Yeah, this is a surprising thing that uh, we have a number of 7th century writing, monastic writings, and you wouldn't know that anything had happened. There wasn't a change of regimes uh -huh. between... Uh, Persian rule and Arab rule, uh, so he he's, hasn't got any hint of what's going wrong, what's going on around him, and in fact, it it was only uh, when 
one of the biographical texts was published in the late 19th century that we knew when he lived and hitherto before that it was thought that he might live in the have lived in the sixth century <laughs> um, uh, one of the biographies says that patriarch george gewagis went to qatar the qatar region and brought him back now we know when the patriarch gewagis was reigning so it's run about 670 so that's after the arab invasions uh, but <clears throat> uh, there's absolutely nothing about his sort of background in the writing that's curious. What was it? Just that he was kind of shut off from the world, living a monastic life. Well, I suppose that's partly it. But he's writing for a monastic audience, okay. and many of his discourses, in fact, aren't really applicable to people to laity. Uh, a lot of them are instructions for people who want to become uh, solitaries, hermits. And uh, he he gives very important instructions for them, but uh, they're not so relevant to uh, non-monastic audience. But at the same time, there's plenty in his writings which seems to me very relevant, and certainly I find them <laughs> very illuminating. And what are some of those applications uh, for for you know laity? Um, well, let me uh, quote one or two short sayings which indicate the sort of um, the, the the sort of wisdom that he has mm -hmm. in um, mm -hmm. en passant, as it were. Yeah. Um, this is rather nice. <clears throat> uh, he says, "Don't be inept in the requests you make to God; otherwise, you will be insulting God through your ignorance." And then he goes on to say, when someone asks a human prince for a load of dung, not only will that person be despised as a result of this despicable request, but he is also offered an insult to the prince by means of the stupid request. <laughs> exactly the same applies when someone asks for things of the body in prayer. <laughs> so in other words we, we need to have a little bit better insight in, into what we're asking yes, before we ask. you need to be careful what you <laughs> and <laughs> there's definitely some application there <laughs> yeah do you see and does the syriac tradition kind of see him as a figure in line with the desert fathers in that tradition um, there's actually very little comment about Isaac in later Syriac writing. Mm. Uh, what the reason for that is, I don't know. But then they don't always comment on monastic writers. Uh, he certainly uh, had a great empathy for the Egyptian monastic tradition, and he quotes the, the Apothecmata, the sayings of the fathers, a great deal. Uh, that's one of his um, various sources. So he knows those writings well. They got translated into Syriac in the 6th century, and then in the 7th century, they were compiled in a form which he would have been familiar with, which <clears throat> um, lists them under topics rather than under the alphabetical list of, um, of Egyptian fathers. Mm. So he was certainly in that tradition, very much mm. in that tradition. And I suppose some of his brief sayings uh, <laughs> do uh, seem to fit in that line very nicely. That's kind of something that I've just observed. He seems to fit into that tradition. So I was, I was curious there. Dr. Brock, I want to thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Are there any works that you could recommend that we would read about um, St. Isaac? Uh, in particular, any works that you've made available? Well, I translated the second part or most of the second part. Uh, that's come out in a an academic edition in Belgium, uh, which I'm afraid is rather expensive. Mm. Uh, but you can read um, the first six homilies of the first part in a good translation by the late Mary Hansbury. Uh, Mary 
is, was a great translator of Syriac monastic literature. Mm -hmm. uh, she was also an icon iconographer, and uh, she never had an academic position. She was she had a doctorate, uh, and she had a great love for Saint Isaac, and she very kindly. Uh, wrote, uh, as the technical term is, an <clears throat> icon of St. Isaac for me. Mm. And I treasure that greatly. So uh, Isaac was always um, a subject of iconography uh, in the Greek and Russian tradition, but th this is a particularly nice one. Um, sorry, I've wandered off your question. Uh, yeah, which, any, well, any works that... Yeah. 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 Yes, um, the first six homilies were translated by Mary uh, in the St. Vladimir's Seminary Press popular patristic series, so they're quite okay. cheap. Um, and very soon, the, uh, the second part includes a very long chapter three, which isn't in my edition, because an Italian colleague was going to translate it and edit it, but um, all these translated it into Italian, he hasn't yet edited it. But I took the advantage of being, as we're confined to the house during the COVID <laughs> restrictions, to translating this long chapter, uh, the headings on spiritual knowledge. Mm. And this, uh, is about to come out from the same publishers and Vladimir's Seminary Press in the again in the popular um, patristic uh, series. So that I hope won't be too much. I haven't a date for the publication, but it should mm -hmm. be imminent since it went to the printer oh, a month or so ago. So um, part one. Um, you've got Mary's translation of homilies one to six, which are very good and gives you a good idea of, of Isaac's writings. The only other um, uh, translation that is available now is actually a very good translation of the Greek homilies of part one, the first collection. And this was produced by the Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Brookline. <clears throat> in at uh, Boston, and uh, they've published uh, a first edition in 1984, and then much more recently, uh, 2011, they've done a slightly different edition, uh, and I do recommend that. It's uh, excellently translated, and the, the translator um, knew, knew Syriac and makes use of it every now and then and some of the Syriac homilies which aren't in the Greek I think are incorporated into that. So that's uh, <clears throat> the the best access mm. to the first part and it's beautifully produced volume two. Uh, for the um, second part I've just spoken about, the third part uh, Mary Hansbury did a translation of that, and that's published by the Gorgias Press in Piscataway, mm. New Jersey. Uh, Gorgias Press um, has done a huge service for Syriac studies. Uh, unfortunately, the publication is often quite expensive, but then the, the press is a small press, uh, it's a family concern, and uh, as I say, they've done huge service because they've uh, republished Syriac texts that no other publisher would touch. And um, it's well worth supporting them. <laughs> uh, there's a very good introduction to Isaac by uh, um, Hilarion Alfeyev. Mm. Now, Hilarion Alfeyev at the time was doing a doctorate. He's a Russian Orthodox monk, and he was doing a doctorate in Oxford. And uh, we got together and read Isaac together. He wanted to do some Syriac. And then eventually he translated Isaac, uh, the second part, into Russian. And he produced this excellent book called The Spiritual World of St. Isaac, published um, 
by Cistercian Press in Kalamazoo in 2000. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Hilary and Alfayev is now Metropolitan Hilary mm -hmm. uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, he's a remarkable scholar. He's also written um, a book on Gregory of Nazianzen and has written a very interesting introduction to the New Testament. Uh, and he's done a history of the Orthodox Church. I mean, he's quite an amazing mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also a very good concert pianist. Is that right? I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, how he does all these things, heaven knows. Yeah. But anyhow, it, uh, his um, little book on the world of St. Isaac is excellent. It's a very good introduction to Isaac. I strongly recommend it. And are there anything that, you know, any works that you're currently working on that you could talk about? Anything that you're going to be producing uh, that you haven't already discussed? Uh, <laughs> trouble is I work on too many things at once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's partly because people ask me to do different things. Yeah, I've yeah. been at a Sura Malabar uh, convention. Of the <clears throat> Sura Malabar church now has an eparchy in United Kingdom, mm. and the bishop was one of my students for <clears throat> doing the master's studies and Syriac studies, and he invited me to give a lecture. So I, the last thing I've done was um, for a brief introduction or an hour's introduction to uh, Sura Malabar spirituality, which oh, is wow. basically uh, the spirituality of the Church of the East. At least that's is what I spoke on. So it's that sort of thing that uh, um, Isaac came into it a bit, of course, but there were many other writers I needed to, to deal with. But I, I dealt mainly with thematic things. Is that available uh, for, um, for reading? Um, no, but you'll find much of the material in a book I did first for a center in India. Mm -hmm. uh, this is... Uh, I think it's called, I, I can never remember what these things are called, <clears throat> Spirituality in the Syriac Tradition. <clears throat> mm. So it, the chief edition will be <laughs> published in India by the St. Ephraim Ecumenical Research Institute, but it was republished in a more presentable form and slightly expanded by the Gorgias Press in Piscataway, uh, where one can easily get hold of it. So th that actually gives an anthology of <clears throat> uh, Syriac spiritual writers um, for for the most of the period, as well as an introduction to and the main themes. Excellent. Dr. Brock, I appreciate your time so much coming on, going over the Syriac tradition in St. Isaac of Nineveh. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Well, that's a tour. It's always good to <laughs> make these wonderful writers known. I've benefited so much from them myself that uh, it would be <clears throat> remiss of me to keep them just to myself. <laughs> right. Well, you're always welcome on the show anytime. I'd love to have you back on. Thank you. And everybody, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. All right. That's going to do it. We'll see you all later. God bless.